This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello! This is Animal Party on Pet Life Radio, which means you're listening to Deb Wolf. I'm the host. And with me today is one of my favorite guests. If you're looking for his work, you can find his blog on Canine Corner, that's what it's called, at Psychology Today at their website. Psychology Today website, Canine Corner. So we're talking to Dr. Stan Corn, professor at UBC of uh, psychology, but also author of many best-selling books, including The Intelligence of Dogs. And uh, he's my go-to for all the why questions. Why do dogs do this? How are humans and dogs different? And a lot of times you send me those questions. So I ask him, welcome to the show, Dr. Corn. Hi there, Deb. The other day, I got a call from someone with a husky, and uh, she had a very thick accent and was having trouble explaining herself, so I had to guess what was wrong. And I guessed, does the husky pull? Yes. I guessed, does the husky escape? Yes. I guess, does the husky jump up on the children? Yes. She said, you must be psychic. I said, no, I am not psychic. <laughs> So there really is something to the breed. I know that people say don't judge a breed and only judge the dog. But the thing is, breeds are breeds for a reason, right? And I'm hoping you'll explain that to people, that we're not somehow stereotyping when we look at a golden retriever and think that it probably likes swimming or a Jack Russell and think that it probably barks when it sees something on the other side of a fence and wants to kill mice. These are real things, right? It's not just us being affected by looks. It's what we bred them for. I mean, you must understand that for roughly 14,000 years, we've been systematically uh, breeding dogs for certain qualities. You know, the trick here is there are things which we want the dogs to do and ways in which we want the dogs to behave. And People have been engaging in seat-of-the-pants uh, behavior genetics. So they find a dog who's particularly responsive uh, to human signals or words or whatever else. And by the way, their neighbor has another dog of the opposite sex who is also particularly nice and, uh, and responsive. And so we breed them together and the puppies are very responsive. And so they're cherished and taken care of and we breed them systematically and so forth. And in that way, you can create, if you will, some uh, working habits for, uh, for dogs and also their temperament. And, it, and they're quite automatic. I mean, I went to visit a, a friend of mine a while back uh, and she breeds Shetland sheep dogs, these little Shelties, and it had been raining. And when I pulled up to her place, there was a big puddle in front of her garage and she was out over there with, with uh, one of her dogs. And there was a little puff of wind and it started some uh, ripples running across uh, this, this, this big puddle. And the next thing I knew, this dog was trying to herd the ripples in so the puddle. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's completely built in. And, you know, the companion dogs, for the most part, have been bred so that they are empathic. I mean, their special uh, skill is empathy. In my book, The Intelligence of Dogs, we talk about three kinds of canine intelligence. The first of them is instinctive intelligence. And instinctive intelligence is simply what the dogs have been bred to do. So, you know, herding dogs herd and guard dogs guard and retrievers retrieve and so and forth. sled dogs pull from my first example. Exactly. And <laughs> they have been bred for those particular purposes. And it also includes temperament. Okay. That's really important. Do you know where the term spaniel comes from? You know that dog breeds are usually named after um, either the person who bred them. So there really was a, a parson, John Russell, which the Jack Russells are named after. And there 
really was a Herr Doberman, which the Doberman pinchers are named after and so forth, or the place which they are um, bred. So you have English bulldogs and Irish setters and that sort of thing. Well, the span in Spaniel comes from Spain, Espanol, okay? Mm -hmm. So that suggests that the Spaniels were bred in Spain. But there was never a Spaniel created in Spain. So, okay. so why are these dogs called Spaniels? Well, it had to do with the fact that at the time when these breeds were coming out, the mythology was that the greatest lovers in the world came from Spain. Ah. And, and here you had these kissy-faced dogs. Yes, bred to love, love, love. So they're Spanish. So regardless of the facts, they clearly had to be from Spain. So that's the way we get Spaniels. Okay, so Dr. Gordon, we have to go to commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about more wired-in features because you can take advantage of these wired-in features if you know what they are. For example, if you have a Sheltie and you want it to come when called, walk away from it quickly. It will catch up. Okay, so stay tuned. We'll be back with a quick commercial break. Animal Party Pet Life Radio with Dr. Stan Corn. Stay tuned. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com Hello, we're back with Animal Party, Pet Life Radio, and Dr. Corin. Okay, so we're talking about wired in features, and the love, love, love of the spaniel was where we left off. I know that Shelties are herding dogs, so are German Shepherds, so are Blue Healers and Border Collies, but they herd differently. And if you know what you've got and how it works, you can have a dog who always wants to herd you, which means it will never leave you. It will come when called. So with a German Shepherd, turning around is a big deal. With a Sheltie, walking away is a big deal. And the Blue Healer always wants to be behind you. The Border Collie always wants to be ahead. So if you know these things... Now you know how to move to make your dog come to you. What else would you say is important about these wired-in features that people should know when they're going to get a dog and they think, oh, I'll just pick the one with the spots? Well, it's really important to know the history of your breed, at least a little bit, okay? So, you know, generally speaking, uh, we can say that all retrievers are very, very friendly. They're kissy-faced dogs. But it doesn't hold for all retrievers. For example, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever was bred specifically not only to pay attention to people and to go out into cold water and retrieve ducks, but also to guard the uh, cache of ducks. And so they are nippier and a little bit more suspicious than all of the retrie other retrievers because they're the only ones who have a little bit of wired in guarding behavior. So you you know you've got to know a little bit about um, each of the breeds. Uh, for example, you have to know that all terriers are born to bark. That's it. I mean, we bred them that way. And chase, uh, <laughs> bark and chase. That's right. And I'm sure you have encountered this many times uh, yourselves. You know, somebody comes in and says, you know, I live in an apartment or a condo or whatever else. And I decided the perfect dog for me would be a Yorkshire Terrier. Yeah. And, and but, you know, can I stop him from barking? The answer is no, you can't stop him from barking. Yes. And you know what? Don't do the debark because it just makes the bark annoying. It doesn't oh. help with anything. The debark surgery that is sometimes done, which I think is so awful, doesn't really work. It makes this scratchy, squeaky, horrible squawk noise. That's it doesn't right. work. Don't do that. 
it's better to teach your dog quiet and reward him for quiet and try not to get a terrier if you're in a situation like that. Um, That's right. There's some other surprises, I think. Like, I think some people would assume that Dalmatians are lovey because of Disney. Like sometimes, or today I saw on the news, this beautiful Rottweiler dog fell off a cliff on the North Shore here in Vancouver, went into the river, plunged into the river, got back on the cliff. People had the good sense to call 911. Rescue team came, got the dog. And I was standing with a bunch of people watching it. And the people in the room said, oh, no, it's a Rottweiler. And I thought to myself, oh, good, it's a Rottweiler. He'll know they're there to rescue him and he'll be good about it. This won't be a problem. And sure enough, it wasn't a problem. But sometimes dogs have a reputation that isn't quite right. I love Rottweilers on a farm with, with people. I mean, they're really good dogs, but they got a bad rap. Yeah, well, and, you know, you brought up the Dalmatian. I mean, you know, a lot of people think that because, you know, they've seen Pongo and all mm -hmm. of the other Disney Dalmatians, that they're going to be marvelously uh, friendly dogs. But the, that's not what they were bred for. The, the Dalmatian was uh, originally designed to be a carriage dog. He was designed, and this is genetic, by the way, and you, and you can show that... Uh, that if the parents have the appropriate genes, the puppies have these automatic behaviors. But they were designed to be uh, good around horses and to run either beside or under the carriage, under the front axle of the carriage, behind the horse's feet. And then when the carriage stopped, they were designed to guard the carriage. So in other words, these dogs were bred to be the first car alarms. Because the truck was valuable, right? That's right. Exactly. And you didn't want somebody to come in and grab your carriage while you were, you know, off socializing or whatever else. And so this is an inappropriate dog, I believe, to bring in with very young children because... Yeah, they can be nippy. They can. And when kids bring their friends in, you know, these dogs go into guarding mode. You know, who is this stranger in the house and, and what are they doing here? Or even worse is, uh, you know, dad comes to pick up the kid that's been playing with your kid and walks through the door. And that strange man in the house, bingo, <laughs> goes off, right? Even worse. I could totally see that. We are going to have to go to a break, but we will be back. Dr. Corin, can you finish your thought before we go to the break? Well, I was just going to say, so if you know a little bit about the history of a dog, uh, that'll help you a lot. And I would advise, you know, you just do a little bit of a Google search uh, before you hit the shelter or before you decide on a particular breed. Okay. And I know we've talked about this before, just before we go to break, to clarify, what you see is what you get. That's what you told me years ago when I asked you about mutts. If the dog yeah. looks mostly like a golden retriever, that's mostly what you're going to get. If it looks mostly like a pit bull, well, that's mostly what you're going to get. Is that still true? Yep. Uh, I mean, it's obviously not as good as having a purebred dog where your prediction is much more solid. But there's actual research, which was done way back in the 60s by uh, J.P. Scott, and it showed that your best guess as to how a dog is going to be behave is what it looks like. So if it looks like a Scotty, it's going to act like a Scotty. Okay, so we're going to break. We'll be back next. And I'm going to ask the right age and the wrong age. Because dear Marius, this great Pyrenee dog, he's two years old. He's ready to go to a wonderful home. The people who had him before had to give him up because it was the wrong age. The kids were the wrong age to get this dog. The kids are already supposed to be on their own and out. And they dumped two dogs on mom. So what is the right age to get a dog for kids? We'll be back to talk about that. If you're on your own, you're in your 20s or 30s and you're not yet stable and you're not yet settled, maybe a 110 pound dog is not something your mom deserves to have visit permanently. So we'll talk about that when we come back for break. Also, you know, when do you get it for your little kids? Okay, stay tuned to Animal Party Pet Life Radio. Take a bite out of your competition. 
advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There's no other pet related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Radio.com, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Hello, we're back on Animal Party Pet Life Radio. This great dog, Marius, he's a great Pyrenees, two years old, hasn't done a thing wrong. He's been wonderful with children, pets, dogs, cats, chickens, goats, you know, just a great dog. But the guy who bought him didn't think it through. And now the dog's been kind of dumped on his mom and she has a move planned and it's just poor Marius. Now he needs a new home. So I think sometimes people get dogs for kids when the kids are way too little or already almost ready to be done with it. 15, 16, ready to start driving, go off to college. What's the right age, Dr. Gorn? Well, it depends upon the dog. I mean, if you've got teeny tinies uh, running around, um, you know, you can get yourself a beagle. Uh, uh, They are... um, highly sociable little dogs uh, and relatively unbreakable and uh, they are certainly not going to harm your child but you were talking about a rottweiler before i mean i don't recommend rotties around toddlers um, not because i'm worried that the 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 rottie's going to eat your kids but rather if he gets excitable and you get a 110 pound dog and he spins around and his hips hit your child it can cause some harm so you you have to do a balancing act here you know big dogs are for school age kids and above um but also, uh, I also, I just want to caution, if the dog is too, too tiny, like a four pound teacup chihuahua, little kids can hurt that dog. So, oh, yeah. right. We don't want to go too small, right? No, you want a, a dog who is, who is relatively sturdy. So, you know, I have no problems with uh, little kids being around uh, beagles, for example, uh, who are who actually are big, strong, uh, their bones are big. The dog is small. The um, teacup poodle might be a better gift for a, a very calm teenager, not not a kid who's rough and tumble and likely to fall that's, themselves, that's, right? Because they break bones when they get fallen on there or dropped. A little kid will, will drop a chihuahua on a tile floor and break its leg. It's so sad. Yes. So, you know, if you want a, a dog for small kids, there are, there are a lot of good selections. If you can put up with a hare, the Pekingese is a wonderful dog. Um, it, it's, it's strong and sturdy. And, and there are a whole bunch of, um, of dogs which have evolved out of that line. So they include the pug and the um, um, uh, the chin and uh, uh, the loss ops and that sort of thing. Um, they're sturdy dogs. They're small, but they're sturdy. And and if if some of those other dogs uh, you know are too hairy for you, uh, there's the uh, or you have hypoallergy or you have allergenic kids. Uh, you know, there's the the um, uh, Coton de Toulier and the Havanese and, of course, uh, the Bichon Frise. Uh, and they're all sturdy enough. Um, um, there are big dogs which, you know, can do well around children. Um, um, some of the larger Spaniels uh, do well. And, um, and a lot of it's training. You teach the dog to be careful. Exactly. And, you know, if you get a, um, a smaller retriever, um, uh, they do well around kids. So the, the toller or the, uh, the Labrador retriever, just don't get one of those 
those big Alaskan labs, which is 26 inches at the shoulder. You want one which is more like more British More like style. 50 pounds as opposed to 90 pounds. Exactly, right. And, yeah. But, yeah. you know, when you talk about the Roddy, even though I also wouldn't necessarily recommend them for little, little kids, I would still prefer to see a Roddy with a little kid family than a Dalmatian, honestly. It's oh, yeah. Well, easier for me to work with. <laughs> well, you know, it really is a matching of, of the breed with the um with the ch with the uh, the family i mean uh a newfoundland for example big big dog right um and bigger than the roddy so why you know am i saying newfoundlands are okay around kids because they hardly uh, move that's why. exactly <laughs> like they, a big carpet <laughs> they they used to be called um hearth mat dogs there you go because uh they used to come into the house and lay down in front of the fireplace and pretend that they were a rug uh and and also they're incredibly tolerant so right the kids uh, can climb all over them don't care that's right so you know, it 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 really is a choice of 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 the breed and the um, and the uh, kids. But also remember the other end of the spectrum. Okay, um, as you grow older, you become a little bit more frail, and it becomes more difficult to handle even a well-behaved, uh, really big dog. I mean, yes. Uh, you know what? I agree with that. Even in my situation, breeding, you know, my, my parents used to be 90 pounds. Now they're 50 pounds. I'm older now. <laughs> I have to lift all these dogs in and out of cars sometimes, right? And puppies. And so you got to keep in mind size for that reason, too. There's the perfect size for your perfect stage. What about when the kids are a bit older, Dr. Korn? Like, uh, say you got a family where most of the kids are between 8 and 15. Can you go for the big dog? Can you go for oh, what, oh, or is yeah. any dog okay at that age? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the 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 uh, uh, kids at at that age, um, I think their childhood is completed by having either a retriever or a spaniel. Um, uh, those are 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 active dogs, but they're uh, incredibly uh sociable dogs because you you've got to recognize that kids at that age have an extra need it's not just moving around and that sort of thing but they're going through uh, growing pangs and and they're going to have social problems and that sort of thing and psychologists uh and and a number of researchers have shown that kids are much more likely to tell their problems to their dog than they are to their parents and to work out their problems by talking to their dog. So if you've got a particularly sociable, friendly breed, um, uh, they fulfill those needs because they will sit and, and, and gaze at you and interact with you uh, when you're talking. So, you know, it's not just the physical aspects here. It's also the psychological support aspects, which are important. And um, I guess to, to add to that, because you, you said if you have allergies in the home when you were talking about the smaller dogs, I would say when you're talking about these 50 pounders, uh, you know, I'm biased, but golden doodles and labradoodles are just that. They're, they're perfect for these families. They've got the retriever love thing going on, but they don't shed very much or not at all. So, yeah, the uh, you know, and there's also the Portuguese water dog uh, and the American water spaniel uh, and the Irish water spaniel. Those are all uh, hypoallergenic uh, dogs. And also, if you're not worried about allergies and you are looking at rescue and you are thinking about a dog in this category, you got a bustling, busy family, try to pick a dog if you're looking at mutts, and I love mutts, pick one that has what Dr. corn has been calling the retriever trait. So what you want to look for is flip the paw over, see if there's some webbing, a little bit of skin between each toe. Look at the mouth. Look at the shape of the mouth. Is it pointy like a terrier? Is it 
like a giant catcher's mitt or is it round and soft like a golden retriever in a lab? So you kind of got to look at these traits. Are the ears upright? Are they floppy? These, these are what we're saying. Because I think maybe you can add to this a little bit, Dr. Corn. When we were trying to describe what to look for in a mutt, and you said look for retriever traits, maybe people don't exactly know. Are there more they could look for? Yeah, there are, there are uh, a bunch of things that you can, can look for. I mean, uh, the, the trick is uh, what scientists call neoteny, which is... Um, uh, simply a sexy way of saying that when the dog grows up, he still has some puppy-like characteristics. Right. So okay. generally speaking, dogs, uh, you know, uh, in the wild, puppies have floppy ears, uh, but, uh, you know, wolves and jackals and that sort of thing, uh, when they grow up, have those those pricked ears, those pointy ears. So as a general statement, a dog with floppy ears is apt to be uh, a bit gentler than dogs with prick ears. Um, it's also the case um, that there are a few little tricks which you can um, it, it, call them mini tests. Um, and that is whether or not the dog will spontaneously approach you. So if you, even if you don't know the dog, if you sort of slap your thighs and back up a couple of steps and go in a, in, in, in a mommy voice, puppy, puppy, puppy. Um, if the dog starts to approach you spontaneously, that's a really, really good sign. Okay. Uh, of sociability. And, um, and it's so easy. I mean, you know, little interactive tests like that uh, before you take a dog are, are worth the effort because, you know, if, if you're lucky, if the boss is kind, you're going to have that dog for 10 or more years. Well, okay. So I love what you just said. And I want to say that even though there's Corona and it sounds like, according to Dr. Corny's inform me that the shelters are doing less due diligence in the matching. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't mask up and take the dog for a walk. That doesn't mean you can't really see what you're getting. Because if you go to a shelter or a pound or a rescue place or a foster home and you take a dog and you don't take it for a walk, you won't know what it's like to walk that dog. You won't know if you're going to dread it every day or be overjoyed to take it for a walk. Now, of course, there's going to be some training coming in. But if your very first walk with this dog is so unpleasant that you want it to end, it's probably not the right dog for you. If your very first dog walk with this dog is so nice, you, you never want it to end, then it's probably the right dog for you. And, there, and you need to spend time with the dog to know this. So in the case of the one I was talking about, the two-year-old Marius, I've tried him with goats. I've seen pictures of him with cats. I've seen pictures of him with children. I've tried him with many, many dogs. I will for sure offer to whoever ends up with him a definite take back. If they don't want him at any time, I will take him back and find him another home. So that's one thing. I will also go with and help them with any training they need. All this is part of it. The former owner is willing to help as well. This is the kind of support you should get with a secondhand dog. You shouldn't be forced to just decide on a picture or a screenshot or a two minute meeting in somebody's house where maybe they exhausted the dog first and this isn't really what you're getting. You gotta see what you're getting and you should take your time. So I wonder if there's anything you could add to that. I'm sure there is Dr. Korn. Yeah, I mean, it's clearly worthwhile to, to interact with the dog in advance. I mean, there are dogs who look absolutely gorgeous if you take uh, your coffee table book photo of them but they're not so gorgeous when you actually uh, interact with them. I believe that spending a little bit of time with a dog is worth the effort. When I pick my puppies, for example, I try to spend at least an hour in the uh, setting where they were bred, and I just interact with them, see which ones come to me spontaneously, which ones seem a bit spooky, and that sort of thing. And it's worth the effort. I mean, think of it this way. This is the test drive, which you would do on a car. 
Well, and also, you know, what we were saying before about the setting comes in. The dog, when you meet it in the foster home or in the shelter with all these barking dogs, that's not really what you're going to get. That's not real life. When you take it on a walk and you're out for a half an hour, now you're seeing what you're going to get, right? Yep. And most good shelters at least have a quiet room. Mm -hmm. A person can interact with the dog. If not, then you got to step out of the shelter, as you said. Yeah. Well, also because let's say the dog has a real issue with rival male dogs or something, prey drive to squirrels. How are you going to know that in the quiet room? Well, that's true. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, if he's too much for you, it's better to take him back. Don't feel guilty. Pick a different dog. Someone else is right for that dog. There's one for you. But I just want the right match for everybody, you know, and the shelter should be wanting that too. like Marius. I don't want him to go to some place that isn't perfect. I want him to go to perfect, perfect place for them and for him. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can't test for all situations. I mean, I don't recommend anybody bring a squirrel uh, <laughs> into the shelter. In order no, to- no. Okay. But I did see someone bring two ferrets on in harnesses and leashes to the Great Canadian Pet Fair when I was on stage. And there were dogs all over the place. It was in the dog pavilion. And I thought, oh, no, this is like a really bad cartoon. What's going to happen? But things were OK. The dogs were well behaved. Thank God. But don't do that. If you own a ferret, don't take it to a dog show. Come on now. <laughs> it's like one of the exercises which we do in a beginner's obedience class, which is we place a well-socialized cat in a cat kennel and have the dogs heal around it. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> but a little bit of research is really, really worthwhile in advance. And it's also good if you have an idea of what it is which you want. I mean, if you, for example, are highly active, then, you know, there are sighthounds who are, you know, wonderful, sweet dogs, but they're big. Dogs like greyhounds, which make wonderful companions. If you want one, which is a bit Afghan. Well, yeah, Afghans are beautiful, and whippets are are the are your smaller version of the greyhound and Italian greyhound. They're pretty know, small. They're small, but they're very delicate. I mean, you know, we were talking we were talking a while back. I wouldn't like them around kids. I'd worry for their safety. Um, they're just you know so fine, finely built. Yeah, they're fine bone. I know yeah. what you mean by that. Sometimes I, I um, worry about little ones like the Chinese crested and the hairless and the, like all this stuff. It's, it's just so tricky. You really got to know what you're getting. That's another thing. Some of these dogs, besides the behavioral issues, many, many, many dogs come with health issues. So if you're getting a Frenchie, you got to think about skin. And if you're getting any dog with a pushed in face, can you afford it? Do you need pet insurance? Are you a traveler? Because they don't travel as easily as everyone else, and there's extra rules on them. So there's all kinds of stuff like that, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, and you were talking about skin. I mean, there's the there's the Sharpe, which sort of is, <laughs> yeah. uh, is an endless set of dermatological problems. But when we're thinking about dog breeds, there are a lot of the herding breeds, which make absolutely wonderful companions. But some of them, like the Border Collie, are dogs which which come with an additional requirement. I mean, they are the brightest dog in all of dogdom, which means that they can learn anything which you want them to know. But they will also learn anything which they can get away with. Yes. Oh, yes. I had this one. He was owned by a veterinarian. And one time he hurt his paw while he was on a dog walk with me. So I took him to see his daddy in the middle of the day to get his paw treated. And then he kept doing this. He kept faking like he'd hurt his paw just to see his daddy and go on with his day. But we caught him because he wasn't that smart. He was limping on the right. His dad went out to get the x-rays or whatever he was about to do. And he started limping on the left. So we caught him. (laughs) <laughs> the other thing is, you know, a really smart dog, especially if he's an active dog, needs a job. I mean, you can't just leave him in the house for eight, 10 hours at a time, you know, every day. If you do, you know, the dog will get bored and will find his entertainment by ripping up your sofa or that sort of thing. The most destructive dogs I've ever seen were Dobermans, Border Collies, 
And strangely enough, one Brussels griffin that, oh my God, he used to grab wood out of the lady's fireplace and draw on the walls with the embers. Frighteningly smart little guy. So if you don't match the exercise to the dog, you get super smart destruction, right? That's what you're trying to say. Yeah, the dog needs a job, whatever that job happens to be, and that keeps them sane. If you don't give a highly active, intelligent dog a job, they become neurotic and they're smart enough to make you neurotic too. And a job can just be fetching. It can be something as simple as that, right? Taking that border collie to the river or the park or whatever and taking the chuck it ball and just whoop and making him run and bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. It could be something as simple as that or teaching him the names of his different toys and making him get them on command. Or that border collie I told you about with the veterinarian, I taught him to sort the shoes. He liked to sort the shoes in pairs. You know, I mean... Who cares? He liked it. It's okay. And he's a little OCD about sorting the shoes, but it gave him something to do. And I understand what you're saying. It can be, in the case of the retrievers, the job can be loving you. That's right. Loving you, but not just on the sofa. I mean, you have to work a little bit. Yeah, loving you along the walk and keeping you company everywhere you go and greeting you at the door. This This is the retriever's job, often with something in their mouth, right? You know, we've been talking about which dogs are sort of the best dogs for a person. You know, again, when you get a little bit older, we always tend to focus on the kids because we really don't want our dogs to eat our kids. But it's really important now. We have a lot of people who are who are living a lot longer, and it's important for them to start sort of scaling back. My parents used to have standard schnauzers, and they're highly active dogs. And they're big and they're strong and that sort of thing. And when they grew older, it was just too much for them. And so we switched them over to Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, which was the perfect fit for them. The dogs were less active and completely controllable because of their size. So you really have to to make that that match, not just at the front end when the you know the family is kid oriented but at the rear end when you know you've got somebody who is a little bit less agile and less strong i had to cut back from having a flat coated retriever i still wanted another retriever and so i cut back so that i had a uh, nova scotia duck tolling retriever which is the smallest of the retrievers so i went from a 75 pound dog uh, to a 45 pound dog Okay, so I want to ask you about this. Maybe we talked about the pandemic on an earlier show a month ago. And um, I know in England for a long time, elderly people have been able to be exempt from no dogs allowed rentals and no dogs allowed in general and even have their vet bills covered. Because if you're over 65 and you have a pet, it's been proven over and over again, you're less of a drain on the healthcare system because you don't go to the doctor as much and you don't get sick as much. So I'm wondering... With the pandemic, with the importance on pets, with the new realization of this here, is this the time? Is this the time? Is anybody capitalizing on this to lobby for some kind of legislation preventing landlords from denying the elderly or people in general from having pets? Is this, is this maybe the time? It might be the time, my love, but I think one has to be a realist. At this point in time, I don't think it's that there's going to be very much activity in that direction. I would recommend it, but am I sounding like an old cynic? Because psychologists should not sound like old cynics, but I think given the politics of this time, nobody's going to pay any attention. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe you blog about it on Canine Corner in Psychology Today, and then people will pay attention. If you want to read more from Dr. Stan Corn, professor of psychology. He blogs and his blog is Canine Corner. You can find it on the Psychology Today website. I'll put up a link later. And so you can hear from him every week. So Dr. Corn, we've come to the end of the show. Is there anything you'd like to leave people with today? I think that people should recognize that if you've got a dog as a companion, it really helps if you treat him as a companion. So if you chat with him, even though you're not expecting any sort of responses from them, you're actually going to get the maximum psychological benefit from your dogs. And don't feel silly about it because, you know, the the research says that something like 86% of all dog owners talk to their dogs, not just commands and that sort of thing, but things like 
Good Morning Rover or whatever else? Well, I have standard poodles and they understand full sentences. I'm not kidding you. They do. And nuances like, I'm sorry, I can't take you in the car now. I'm going to take you later. Like they know these words. The dogs know a lot more than most people tend to think they do. The average dog knows about 160 words, signs, signals, that sort of thing. But I think they're always receiving our mental photographic images. When we send mental pictures to a dog, they receive it. So they're not just going by our words. They're going by our body language, our smells, our sounds, our habits, because they, they keep track of us, right? Like, especially certain dogs. And my blue healer knows my every movement. He's been watching me for years now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> my old toller, I used to uh, say, knew what I was thinking before I knew what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Well, because your mental picture, that is how I believe that's how they communicate. So I think, yes, talk to your dog for sure. Talk to your dog. Think thoughts to your dog. Just think about touching him and petting him the way he likes and watch how quickly he comes over without you saying a thing. Or think about giving him his favorite treat and watch him start drooling without you touching the treat or bringing out the smell. It's amazing how tuned into us they really are. Yep. The big problem is we don't have tails to wag. <laughs> well, we used to. But yeah. <laughs> I think there's people out there who dress up as dogs who attach them. But I don't think that's a good idea for most of us. So <laughs> there is no wrong age to get a dog for your kid. We figured out today in today's show, it's just which dog. And there's no wrong age for us as we age either. It's just which dog. So I'm really glad about that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Corin. Good to be here, Deb. And I hope we'll have you back on a future show coming up. Thanks again. And maybe the pandemic will be over by then. Uh, good Lord willing and the river don't rise. Okay. Well, let's hope. Let's hope when we talk next that it's soon and the pandemic is done. Thanks again, Dr. Corin, And to everyone out there listening, from all of us at Pet Life Radio and from me, Deb Wolf, be good to your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.